But let's the rest of us stand up just for a second. Take your Bible. Say with me, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So glad that you're here with us today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our focus and so forth and and, uh, God working in our lives. Hebrews 12.1 says that that, uh, we're surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. Um, Let's see. Yeah, all right. And it says, uh, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So out of this, you can see that, that we throw off things that hinder us, Sin that can entangle us. Now, let me just say it this way. Let's, let's, let's throw, aside from the sin part, there are many distractions in life. Distractions to try to pull you away from you succeeding. Just in your everyday life. You see, God wants to teach us to win in life. Win in every day. That every day you just do well. Amen? You can walk in peace, you can walk in joy, you can walk in victory, you can be blessed in your job, you can be blessed in your home if you're married, you're blessed in your marriage, if you have children, you can be blessed with your children. He intends that. He doesn't want us, though, to be distracted with so many things that would take our eyes off of Jesus. And one of the things he says there, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, we're not just seeing him. I can pan over you, see all of you, but then I have to fix my eyes, narrow my eyes in to focus on each one of you. You can see me, but you also see the platform here. So as you look up this way, as you look up this way, just focus on something. Focus on uh, Jesus or a bulb or something like that. Just focus on Lord. Focus on that for a minute. See, in life, there's a lot of things we see, a lot of things we're distracted on, and yet he wants us to be focused especially on him. And it takes, it takes faith and it takes practice. So things are going on all the time to take my eyes off of Jesus and I think, wait, 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 I want to bring my eyes back on Jesus. He's my peace. He's my joy, right? If you lose your peace, then you know your eyes aren't on Jesus, all right? So you don't want to focus on the storm, you want to focus on Jesus, all right? So the things, and we all face stuff, everybody does, but you have to practice this. You have to discipline yourself. An athlete will discipline themselves to to focus on things that they need to do. So in my, in my line of sight, I see many things, but then I can focus, bring that, narrow it in. Narrow it in just on Jesus. That's what he's saying there. Fix, you have all these things that can hinder. You can have sins. You can have things that entangle you. You want to fix your eyes on Jesus because that is where your victory will come. And that is where all these things in terms of peace and joy will be manifested is in Jesus Christ. It's not that you don't have a problem or don't face a storm. No, everybody does. But if you focus on Jesus, he's above all those things. So this focus is like the convergence of of what you see. It comes together in one clear thing. It's your center of attention, your concentration of attention. All right? Could be the center of what your activity is or center of what your interest is in life. You focus. Now, if you go to school, of course, you focus on your classes, right? You should. If you're married, you should focus on your mate or your family and different things at times, right? You do those things. So you have things that focus that helps you to win. An acronym for win is what's important now. You should write it down. What is important right now? There's a lot of things that might be on the burner. What's important now? What should I do now? What should I focus on now? Because if I look at all the other stuff, I may miss the important thing, which is right in front of me, which is the right now thing. Amen? 
Jesus came to Mary and Martha's house, Luke chapter 10. Martha was the one who invited Jesus, all right? It wasn't Mary, it was Martha. She invited Jesus to the house. And so uh, Mary sat at Jesus' feet, heard his words. Martha was distracted, distracted, focus-wise, with serving all the things, the food, the settings, getting things ready, all that stuff. And so she approached Jesus, said, don't you care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Now, we know this story, but let me repeat it. So tell her to help me. (laughs) Tell her to help me. And Jesus said to Martha, and I'm sure she didn't expect this response, but Jesus says, Martha, you're worried and troubled about, notice, many things. Now say one thing. One thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So the one thing, the one, the one focus, one needful thing was Jesus Christ. Here you have Jesus right with you, but your focus is on all kinds of other things, right? Think about, okay, we just had Thanksgiving. So in America, uh, in the United States, for a lot of Americans, this is the time the families get together and they have a big dinner and so forth. And most of the time, the focus is on creating this big dinner, <laughs> getting this dinner ready, feeding people. When really, when really the important thing is, the, is the people coming. Amen. Is the family that's coming. If dinner's a little late, who cares, <laughs> right? If something isn't done just right or something gets burned, so what? <laughs> but the focus is the people coming. The focus would be your family if they're coming or your friends if they're coming. See, We always want to think about, as we think about Jesus, we know that he loves people. He loves the world. And so when you're around people, there's a lot of stuff going on, but think about people. Think about the things that that are that are really important. So the little things, the little what you might think is little can become big things. You just have to pay attention to the details. So the big thing to Martha was the food and getting everything ready. What seemed little to her was Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. And all she was doing in terms of work was giving her attention to Jesus Christ. The little things in life, when you do them, can help set you free. You know, you can have a big car, you can have a big car, but it's going to be a little key that's going to either unlock it or start it. People focus on the car They're buying a car. Oh, look at the car. Look at the engine. Or look at the color. Look at the amenities. All the stuff. (laughs) But you won't get anywhere unless unless you walk out with a key. Right? It's like it's like you can do this, you sign, you purchase something, you sign it, and so forth like that. But it's like, what's your focus? Can I have the key, please? Can I have the key? And is it the right key for the right car? Little things are important in life. We're going, to talk about, we're going to talk about changing one thing, but it doesn't have to be big things. People talk about, say, another thing, people talk about weddings. How many people have been, how many married, you're married, people focus on, on what, the attention of the ceremony, the reception, and all the things, they're renting a place, they're buying things, and it costs so much money to get married. The truth of that is, is no, it doesn't. The only thing it costs to get married is to have a wedding license. That's all it costs to get married. I tell people everything else, everything else in a wedding, so they, they, can spend, they could spend thousands of dollars on this reception and food and all the stuff like that. The one key thing is the vows. It doesn't cost much. Isn't that right? So the little thing, the little thing is really the big thing. The little thing is what? The little thing is the vows. For better, worse, richer, poorer, sickness, and health. That's, that might sound little, but those are vows which the Bible places huge amount of, of, of authority on. What you say to each other before witnesses and before God. It isn't all the other, all the other stuff is tinsel. It's like Christmas. We celebrate Christmas, all the decorations, all the things like that. But the reality of Christmas is Jesus, just period, Jesus. Jesus is is the reason for the season. You know, we say that. 
He is the one that we trust, we put our hope in. So the little things, the little things really becomes the big thing. The thing that's necessary, one thing is needful, the thing that is necessary to propel us forward. So there's a lot of things in life that the devil wants to complicate our thinking and complicate how we see things. And Jesus always wants to simplify things. He said, he said to the Corinthian church, I fear lest by some means that you uh, fall away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity. Keep your faith simple. Keep your eyes simple on Jesus. Keep your hopes simple. Now what happens? Then you just begin to win in life. People can look at all the stuff in the world, all the things going on. It's like, all that's a, like a big cloud, whirlwind clouds of storms and so forth. And in the middle of that, you can have your eyes on Jesus. I believe we can walk into the last days with the peace of God, hearing his voice, living his life, and being a blessing to people around us. Now let's look at the scripture a second. It says Philippians 3. So the little things are important. Paul, uh, Paul said this. I haven't, I haven't arrived, and he was very intelligent. He had, had a lot of accomplishments and so forth. But notice what he says. One thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget the things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now say again, say one thing. One thing, one thing is a focus. What did, what did Paul, what, and this is Paul's life, but it affects all of our lives in different ways. But he said one thing. Now, the one thing that he was going to do is what he was going to forget. Why was he going to forget? He was going to forget the past because of all the things that he did wrong. All the, you know, how the devil throws things up like, you're a failure, you've blown it, you've done this and this and this, you know, airs all the dirty laundry. And Paul is forgiven, and yet he still has a memory of his past. And he said, if I'm going to succeed, I've got to forget that. I've got to forget my past history. And I have to begin to follow, you know, what he wants me to do. For a lot of us, we let our past dictate our future. Well, I was this, I was this, I was this. No, no, no. Maybe you once were. I once was, but now I am. Amen. So Paul says there's one thing that's very needful. And it's really important for all of us because why? All of us have an old life probably, right? Unless you just grew up living for Jesus and nothing ever happened, but hallelujah. But otherwise, you know, you got to let that go. And you have to focus, focus on what your future is. It's like when you drive a car, you drive a car. I just, just, I just drove by businesses or a mile marker or whatever, but I can't focus on the past. I have to focus on what's, what's ahead. That's why in your car, you have a big windshield. Your big windshield allows you to see a panoramic view of all the things that are there as well as focusing on the road. And you have a tiny rear view mirror that gives you a perspective. I just passed that. That's in my past. But you don't drive forward looking in your rear view mirror. Otherwise, what will happen? Well, you won't go very far. So, so the one thing that is needful, change, think in your life, in your life, change one thing. Write down, change one thing. Now, there, I understand there could be several things we need to change, but let's just focus, whatever that is for you, change one thing. Change one thing, because one thing will build upon another. It's like someone getting out of debt. We, years ago, we had a financial seminar here and so forth, and they called, they called snowball, uh, debt snowball reduction and so forth. If you're going to pay off your debt, you start with the littlest one first, pay off that little one, then go to the next one. If you started with the big one, you could be working at it, working at it. It never looks like you have any progress. But you start with the little one, all of a sudden, hey, we paid it off. Woo! Now you go to the next one. Chip away, chip away, chip away. Then you go to the, the big, gradually get to the biggest. But in the meantime, you've got all these victories. You've got all these victories as you start climbing out of debt. But you have to focus then at one at a time. Paul looked at this, so, so it's like I've got to focus. I've got to focus on allowing myself to go forward. We met a guy years ago. John and I met a guy years ago who had a terrible past. 
And then in, in, in Africa, he had a terrible past and he harmed thousands of people. And he gets born again, he gets saved, and then he goes around asking for forgiveness. Because he would always see people that he either did damage or harm or so forth in their lives. Paul was just like that. He's in the same area. He's seen people. Oh, boy, I remember imprisoning their family. Oh, I remember giving a testimony so that his brother could die. And so he had to move forward from that. You might have something in your past that the devil tries to condemn you with. Shake it off and move forward. Turn to your neighbor and say, shake it off. <laughs> One thing you've got to do, in that sense, forget the past. Thank God for forgiveness. Amen. Thank God for all that. Doesn't change the past, but now you have to go forward. Change one thing. So we go on here. We go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3 talks about our words. We put bits in horses' mouth. They obey us. We turn their whole body. So with, that, with the reins, we can turn the horse to the left or to the right. The same with ships. They're large, they're driven with winds, but they're turned around with a small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So the pilot, the rudder's in the back, you know that, on the bottom, under the water, turning, based on how you turn the wheel steering the ship. So is our tongue. A little member boasts great things. How great a forest, uh, great a, forest a little fire kindles. Write this down. Change your words. Change your words. If you want to change something about your day, or you want to change something about your future, start changing your words. Start speaking something different. You don't want to say, you know, you know, we've always been, it's always been this way, nothing will change, and you go on and on about the negative. So change your words. In Christ, things are happening. In Christ, I'm changing. The world, the, the, my circumstances are changing. God is moving by His Spirit. See, some, a lot of people think God is in control. You know what's in control most of the time? Is your tongue. Because your tongue is what steers your life. We can't blame God for mistakes that we make because we made a choice. We spoke it, we made a choice, and so forth. We can't blame God for that. So we change, we change our words, amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, change your words. So that means, that means when I go about my day and I hear, you will hear yourself talk, and the most important person to hear yourself is you, so when you hear, if you're speaking faith and so forth, you're hearing faith. You, begin, you just begin to think different. You just begin to, same situation, but it's just how you want to look at it. It's like someone saying the glass is half full and the glass is half empty. Turn to your neighbor and say, be optimistic. Jesus, Jesus was always optimistic. <laughs> you know, people uh, tend to, sometimes they'll tend to doubt stuff and just say, well, begin to doubt your doubts. You might be thinking, I'm not sure if that can happen. Just say, well, I'm just going to doubt that. I think it can happen. I think God can open the door. I think God is answering that prayer. I think God is moving by His Spirit. I believe God is providing for every need that I have. So we begin to steer our lives. So at the end of the day, you still, you still feel good. Maybe something hasn't changed in the natural, but you feel edified in your spirit, man, because of what you spoke. Your words are powerful. Your words are creative. They create an atmosphere around you. So if all we're doing is complaining, it's just a negative atmosphere. Who wants to be around that, right? <laughs> when our family gets together, we're all speaking things that are going to bring faith. So, in other words, it's not a downer. It'd be real different. You get it together with someone, you know right away someone's just, they're grumbling, they're complaining, like, ooh, wow, okay, let me get another glass of punch. <sighs> let me get away from that person, you know? It's not any fun to be around that. It's not any fun to be around yourself when you're speaking things to yourself that are bad. Not any fun. When Jesus made you, Jesus made you to walk in victory. He made you in his image. 
He has got great things aimed at you. And we have to remember that. All right, Philippians 4.8. Write this down. Change your thoughts. Change your thoughts. Philippians 4.8 just says, the things that are true, the things that are noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. In other words, think on these things. Your thoughts, your thoughts will become your words. So you want to change your thoughts. How, how, every day, I'm, I'm, sitting in the word, I'm sitting in the Bible and so forth, but the Lord will talk to me all the time and just say, hey, think of it this way. Look at it this way. And so your thoughts, your thoughts begin to bless your soul, and bless your spirit. You're changing your thoughts. Paul said, think on these things. Now, he had to learn this. So it's not like, well, he was an apostle, so he just knew all this stuff. No, he had to learn it. He was a sinner, <laughs> terrible sinner, saved by grace. Now he's growing in faith, which we all are doing, grow in faith. And he had to learn these things, to think on these things. Why? Because his mind naturally, naturally, we're going to go to the negative. That's the old man. We're going to think on the bad. Well, I was, boy, I really messed up. Well, I just blew it. My life is, is wasted. I have no future now. Everybody's got a future. Everybody's got a future. It's a matter of how you want to look at it. You could think, you can think, well, I, I don't have any money or I don't have this or that. It's not based on those things. It's based on this relationship first and foremost. So think, you know, change your thoughts to fit the thoughts of God. How does Jesus, what is Jesus going to say about you? If you're sitting on your couch and you're just listening, Lord, what are you saying about me? I'll guarantee you he's going to tell you how much he loves you. I'll guarantee you he's going to tell you how, how much he's got a good plan for you. He's not going to bring up your past. Well, you really blew it, and I don't know if I can salvage this. <laughs> not going to think that way. He's going to bring up something good about you because he's got a plan for you. Always does. It's not complicated. Change, just change something. Just change one thing. We talk about changing your words or changing your thoughts, the thing that is needful, that every, every time, every moment, what's needful right now. Let's look at another one. Look at Galatians chapter 5. This is a little tiny verse, but it says, talks about self-control. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, faithfulness. Uh, do I have verse 23 there? There we go. Gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. Now, this word, another word is temperance. Self-control. What does that mean? That means you are going to help control you. You are controlling yourself. That is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Still God working, but, but rather than feeling like, I don't have any power, I can't do anything. Oh, you have all kinds of power. You can make a choice right now, you're going to do something different. Self-control. People, you know, especially... Especially in America and so forth, people are grumbling all the time about finances and this and that. Change your spending habits. Yeah, was really, years ago we had the financial thing that, that then they talked about the people in Omaha, they had this figure made well over $100,000 a year, living paycheck to paycheck, could, just couldn't make it. We just don't have enough. And the guy just said, well, what are you spending it on? And they said, well, I don't know. We just like everybody. He says, well, why don't you make a record of what you're spending on? Whether well, they're wasting money. Money's flying out the door, flying out the window, and all kinds of stuff. You know, a lot of people in America don't cook anymore. Hello. <laughs> they don't cook. They just, they just buy their food made out there. You know, let's go to the restaurant. Let's go to the drive through uh, Let's order at Grubhub, whatever. And someone will deliver it for me. God forbid that I'd have to cook. So when you think of self-control, like, like this, if you're going to do something on your spending habits, well, then you have to just pull back and think, what am I spending on? Control yourself. Uh, uh, Christmas is a huge thing for businesses, and we want businesses to be blessed, but are you buying what you need? Or what you want? Or maybe just buying to impress somebody? I don't know. But you have to stop and think, what am I spending my money on? 
Who's going to control? Who's going to control my checkbook? Well, you aren't. <laughs> I'm the one writing the checks. That that's makes me old-fashioned, doesn't it? For you young people. Who's going to control my spending card? Let's say it that way. <laughs> my debit card. It's me. It's mine. It's got my name on it. It's what I put it out there for. So who's going to control it? Well, I am. We can say all the time, Lord, Lord, just, just help me, Lord, help me, Lord. And then we come to a decision and just not think about it. And we spend some. He says, the question is, why would you do that? Self-control. Change one thing. Self-control. Change your spending or change your eating habits. Rather than eating everything that's in front of you, be selective in what you eat. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do that. I mean, this is, this is life, right? But, if, but if, you, if you, rather than make it complicated, stop and think, well, what can I change? What's one thing I can change in my diet? What's one thing I can change in my diet? I mean, I love those donuts from Wall Drug. Wow. That's like they got crack in them, man. It just, but you can't eat those every day, right? It's, it's like it's, uh, it's something here or there. It's like... Ah, delicious, but get away from me, you know. It's like someone said, get behind me, Satan, and don't push, you know. So I, I, I wouldn't want them sitting on my table every day, right? So you change something. Don't make it complicated, though. Change one thing. See, people can talk about America unhealthy, and yet I can go to other countries, and they eat a huge amount of rice, and so the diabetes rate is very high because of the carbs, so the diabetes. And we're praying for people with diabetes all the time. And people think, well, they would never have health problems. No, they do have health problems. <laughs> What's the change one thing? Well, just don't eat so much rice, <laughs> right? Just don't eat so much. It's like, it's like uh, uh, we're served and so forth, and we put our hand over our plate. Thank you, no more, no more thank you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do this. Don't make it a bunch of things. Just in everything, in areas of your life, think, well, what can I change? It's something you're facing today or struggle. What can I change? What's one thing I can change? What's one thing I can change? Amen? Amen. When you think about it, that causes you, that causes you to take back, again, something in your life where you felt maybe it was out of control and now it takes you back into your control and you feel like, I can manage this. I can come out of debt. I can eat healthier. I can be blessed. Change one thing. It's not, not, uh, not complicated or so forth, but think about this. Some of you, uh, we've, most we've all got a phone. Change the thing. Take your phone and use it. People are scrolling. You can go any place in this world. You can be at a game. People are scrolling through their phones. Game's going on in front of them. You know, not even aware of the score. They're just scrolling through their phones. Go to the student section. The students the st probably texting the person five people down from them. <laughs> not about the game because they're not watching the game. They're just, they're just into their world. But what if you begin to use that, change something, and realize, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to text every day. I'm going to text somebody, and I'm going to bless them. I'm going to get a scripture. I'm going to bless them. And you begin to turn that around and say, Here's, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into their world with a good report, not a bad report. It's not like, and the Lord told me you need to repent. No, 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 not that kind of message. A message that God loves you so much. He's on your side. That could be to somebody who's not saved. You know, that, like, I, like I can throw things out to my brothers. You know, they've given their lives to Jesus now, but I throw out things, you know, about following him. You can take that, change that, change your habit rather than all just the stuff that you see and do something creative with it. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 10. There's a horizontal relationship and there's a vertical relationship. That's where we come, that's where we come when Jesus talks about, he talks about the commandments, loving your neighbor as yourself and don't lie and all those things like that. And then you have this vertical relationship, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
So the guy comes and he kneels. He says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one's good but God. Do you know the commandments? Do not commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now, all those commandments are horizontal. Okay, that's like this way with us. Okay, the next scriptures go this way. And the guy says, you know, I've done this. I've done these things. I've, I've kept those things. And Jesus looked at him and said, one thing. Say one thing. One thing you lack. So his, his life looks commendable. This guy was a nice guy and he did everything right and so forth. Listen, we're not going to get to heaven because we're good. We're going to get to heaven because he's good. Because of his amazing grace. It will never be because I've accomplished all these things. No, no, no. It all becomes thank you, Jesus, for your grace. <laughs> Always because of that. Amen. So this guy in the natural was good. Oh, man, what a model citizen. But Jesus said, one thing you lack. Notice, one thing you lack. Now, he said, go sell what you have. Give to the poor. Now, this is this situation, all right? You'll have treasure in heaven. Come take up your cross and follow me. Now, the guy, the guy leaves, and he's sad. In this particular case, his God was his resources or his money, right? That's in this case. He's not telling everybody, go sell everything you have. No, he's not saying that. He's just saying in this case, this is what blocked him in his relationship with God. You have a horizontal relationship. There's a vertical relationship. Jesus said, one thing you lack. Now, we would all say, I want to grow in the Lord, right? I want to grow in the Lord. Of course, most of you, we only see on a Sunday morning. <clears throat> you could chuckle there. <laughs> Don't see you uh, at other services or Wednesday or prayer meeting or Wednesday night or anything like that. We see you on a Sunday morning. Most people say, I really want to grow in the Lord. And then we say, well, why don't you change something? Why don't you change one thing? Well, part of that would just be in the Bible, right? How often? I'd say every day. You eat natural food every day. You should eat spiritual food every day. It's just a, it's just a question. It's not, a, it's not like a giant thing. Oh, I'm going to fast for 10 days or 30 days. or <laughs> Not that way. Just change one thing. People say, I'm busy. Then get up earlier. But I'd be tired. Then go to bed earlier. I'll just say this. Not much good happens after 10 o'clock. You should all say amen. That's just true. Nothing, most, most of the time, nothing good on TV. Nothing else good happening after 10 o'clock. So, so you set things, and thank God for an alarm, right? And I know you're all here really early today. But you could, if you weren't, you could change one thing. Set your alarm. What a novel idea. When our daughter was sick, and we had to get up in the night and help her, and we had to dress her and different things like that, and we were pioneering the church, and so we were hauling equipment also on a Sunday morning, and so we would set everything out the night before, just what, what we all were wearing, so that we already knew the next morning. We'd get everything ready the night before, so as much as we could was done, so that when we got up on Sunday morning, because we had to get up early in spite of her health, get up early, get dressed, and come into Brookings and get ready for the service. Just a matter of changing something, changing your perspective, right? Your time, what time you're going to get up, what you're going to do when, and so forth. You're changing something. We had a couple that came to the church. He was retired. Well, at the time, he's still a physics professor at SDSU, but his wife was in a wheelchair. And they would be at every service early. Uh, oh, what a great example. Irv and Betty, the same way. Irv would help Betty and so forth. They'd be at every service early. And Betty was in a wheelchair. It's all a matter of how they focused their things. It wasn't like giant decisions. No, just focus when you're still going to get dressed anyway, right? Hello? <laughs> so you're going to come anyway just to focus on adjusting things time wise. Change one thing. So here, here he is, Jesus just saying, keep your focus based on your vertical relationship with Jesus Christ. Keep that clear. When that is clear, he does help all the other things, how I interact with people and so forth. 
But you don't have to change several things. Just change one thing. Keep that focus. Be in the Bible. Turn to your neighbor and say, be in the Bible this week. Bible. Tell them every day. <laughs> You'd be surprised, especially if you haven't been in the Bible much. Stay in the New Testament, right? Don't get buried in Leviticus someplace. Be in the New Testament. Listen to what the Lord, what Jesus is talking to you about your life. Let me just do a couple more things. Ephesians, Ephesians 4, change one thing. Well, he says, put off the old man. So, <clears throat> If I have clothes on, if I have clothes on that are dirty, say, I've been working outside or something, I can't, I can't go in and think, well, I'm just going to throw on new clothes on top of those old clothes. No, I have to change, first of all. So I change one thing, I change those clothes. So I put off the old man, I put off the old conduct, I put off the old things that I was doing, right? Then I renewed in the spirit of my mind. I probably get washed myself up and so forth like that. And then I put on clean clothes right? So then you put on the new man, which after God is creating righteousness and true holiness. So, so it's just one thing at a time. You're doing one thing at a time. Man, I'm going to throw off these old clothes, put them in the hamper, so forth, and we'll get washed up and all that. Now I'm going to put on clean clothes. Change one thing. Just make the effort. Just make the effort to do that. Just, just whatever, the Holy Spirit will bring things up in your life about something that you can, you can change. It's not all, Lord, you just, you just do it, Lord, and he'll say, and that's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit that gives you self-control. The Holy Spirit gives you love, joy, peace, and all those things. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit, so that now you, and I'm talking to you, the world, the world lacks a lot of power, but you don't lack power. You don't lack anything. You have everything that you need to walk in the victory that he wants you to walk in. You have everything you need to live a life that's blessed, blessed, blessed to the Lord. He doesn't want to make us complicated. He wants us just to follow simplicity. A couple more things. Let's go to the Gospel of John a second. John chapter 9. This is a story of about a man who was healed, a man who was blind and so forth like that. He's healed. Uh, in the temple on the Sabbath day, and the Pharisees are upset, you know, that it happened, and you know how those stories go. And, and the parents, uh, the, the Pharisees bring the parents here, and of course, they're scared of the religious rulers, and so they say to them, he's of age, ask him. He's old enough to ask for himself, because they, they knew their son was blind, now he sees. They knew his life changed, and, and, and so they said, just, just ask him. So the responsibility isn't theirs. They're kind of passing the buck. So they call the man that was blind, and they said, you should give God glory. We know that this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus, that he's, he's, uh, they thought of him as a rebel, and so he was causing problems and all the things like that. And the man said this, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. I don't know whether he's a sinner. I don't know that. But one thing I know says I was blind and now I see. He didn't have to know everything. He just knew one thing. He didn't know all about Jesus, you know, not from the prophecies of the Old Testament, you know, he's the Messiah that's coming and blah, 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 blah. He didn't have to know any of that. He didn't have to know Scripture. He just said, I don't know about all that, but I know one thing. That I was blind, and now I see. That's a lot with your testimony. You know, I knew I was lost. I knew that was that old life, but now I got saved. I didn't know a lot of scripture. I didn't know a lot of things like that. I remember being in the, in Larson Commons at SDSU, and I'd cut, started my life changed. I'd go up there, have a meal, and so forth, and I bowed my head and I prayed. I was just eating by myself. Did that day after day, and finally, this group of people walked up to me and said, "What happened to you?" And I just looked at them, I said, what do you mean? They said, you're praying before you eat? They've been watching me. All I can say is, well, I don't know, but in the bar, God spoke to me and my life changed. I've been born again. I didn't know a lot of scripture. I couldn't go, and the word says this, and the word says, I didn't know that. But I knew I got saved, hallelujah. I knew he changed my life, and I knew it was all him because I couldn't do it on my own. Guy says, I don't know all that, but one thing I know. I don't know everything, but I know something. I know something. <laughs> Philippians 3. We'll close with this. 
So Paul, back to this front again. Paul says, so I'm going to press toward the mark. So as this one thing I do, I forget what's behind me. I'm going to press toward the goal, the prize, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to know there's one mark, there's one goal. I can't, uh, you know, a track person, you know, could, if they're running, if they're running a, 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 a 1,500 meter or whatever, they're running a race, they run it to go to one place to stop their goal. And everybody would have that goal. And in life, in life, the same thing, you have one marker, one goal at a time. So what is your goal? What are you aiming for? Phys Ed, I remember, <laughs> remember as a kid, you know, in Phys Ed, they want to teach, in high school, they want to teach you a lot of things. So they brought out bows and arrows to teach us archery. And it's like, to me, that's like Greek. It's like, okay, you know, and they put a target on bales and so forth. I was happy if I hit the bale. But you're aiming at a mark. It's, it's a circle, circle with, con, with concentric circles within it. Ultimately, you're aiming at this dot in the middle. Good enough for me to aim at the bale. Golfing, we get out there, Luke, we're golfing and so forth. People, the flag's on the right-hand side. I'm, just, I'm aiming for the green. <laughs> that flag, that's too small of a spot. I'll just aim for the green. That's all. If I get that, Wonderful. But you have to aim for something. Write down something. What am I aiming for? What am I aiming for? What, what is a goal? What is a goal in front of me? What is a goal in front of me? I go to the gym, and Jeannie's been going to the gym more than me, in fact, but I go to the gym, and part of my goal is this. I'll take 70 pounds, and I think of lifting suitcases on a trip, and I'm putting them up, say, above in a flight thing, or I'm carrying them and I'm lifting them onto a belt. So I have a purpose in what I'm doing. You know, lifting things. My goal isn't to be a body lifter. <laughs> you know, body, you know, that type of thing. My goal isn't to put on a lot of muscle. You know. No, my goal is just to be strong enough to do the things that I need to do in my future. Or my goal is to get on a machine and I'm working, my heartbeat gets to 140, <sighs> sweating, you know, doing things. My goal is just to do it so that I can feel like, hey, I can walk through an airport. Or I can walk through that village, or I can do this or that. Think about a goal. Think about what, you're, what are you aiming for. If a basketball player is shooting, he's shooting at one basket. If there's two, he needs his eyes, he needs glasses, all right? Double vision, all right? So he's shooting at one basket. A quarterback is throwing to one receiver. You're not throwing to three or two. You're throwing to one receiver who's got your same color jersey. So that's, that's what you do in life. That's what you do in life. You have a, you have, and this can change. This, this can change throughout the day. What's my goal here now? Or what's my, what's my, uh, what am I aiming for here? See, so it's, we're living life on this basis, so you're maximizing your day, and your day feels blessed. Your day feels blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do this. Let me quick say this. You should, you should have a plan. If you're going to have goals and so forth, and you're doing things, you should have a plan. To fail to plan is a plan to fail. People got all these things, I got it all up here right now. It's like, sure you do. Well, your people run around doing all kinds of things and at the end of the day thinking, what did I accomplish? You should have a plan. You should look at your plan. Well, you should have a yearly plan. How many of you know Christmas will come next year and you don't have to charge for it? Hallelujah. Amen. If you start saving in advance, then you have the money saved for it. Vacation, we can't afford it. Sure you can. You plan for it. You plan, say plan. plan. Jesus was a planner. God is a planner. Everything around us is planned. The sun, the moon comes up and so forth isn't an accident. He plans. And so you do these things. When you talk about changing things, you modify things so that you have success throughout your day. You accomplish things. You feel accomplished. You do more than, with the time that you had than you've ever done before. 
in a sense, you're doing it God's way. People love the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I'm just thinking, well, then you better plan. Because <laughs> he's a planner. Jesus wasn't caught off guard when things happened. He knew in advance. He planned. Strategically went to places and so forth. He planned. What's important today? Hey, we just had revival. We're going to go over to this village. Oh, no, we're not going over there. That's the Samaritans. And we're going over there today. So the Holy Spirit can lead us, amen, and, and guide us and help us to walk in the victory that he wants us to do. Change one thing. Do one thing. Aim at a goal. Set your sights high. Believe for big things. This is all something we can do. I want you just to close your eyes a second. I want you to think about this now. What, what, what are you doing today? Change your words. Change your thoughts. Keep your vertical relationship right. What are you doing today? What are you doing this week? What's coming up this month? What can I change? What can I do different? What can I plan for? What can I aim for? Because God wants you to do well. He wants you to do well. If you want to use the term successful, he wants you to be successful. Joshua 1, it says, you shall have good success <laughs> as you meditate on these things. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that as believers, we have you. We have you. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us fruit. One of those is self-control, and you give us ideas, and you help us in our daily walk, and you help us to live for you, and you help us to have this vertical relationship right. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we can speak life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we can think godly thoughts. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're changing us from glory to glory to glory, better to better to better. Now, the future is wonderful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing in our lives today. And I, I pray, Jesus, uh, you're the teacher, Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you'd help each of us that even from this time to take something from it. Take something from it to grow, to change something, to adjust something, to aim higher, to aim more focused. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for your help. And Lord, we give you praise. We thank you that these are the last days and we are excited <laughs> because you're coming again. That's, that's wonderful. You're coming again, Jesus. I speak blessings over everybody that listens to me right now. The people that are listening online or people in other countries, I speak blessings over them, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, their circumstances might, might be very difficult, but I thank you, Lord, you are their helper. And even in this, Lord, you can help them in their lives today, Lord, in, in walking the way you want them to walk. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you praise, Lord. Uh, let's just lift our hands a second. We just surrender to you. We just say yes to you, Jesus. <laughs> we love you so much. We love you so much, and we thank you for loving us. And we thank you, Lord, for fruit from this. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you say amen?